This might come as a bit of a surprise for you, but one of the fundamental ways to improve the viewing experience is not by getting a bigger or better telescope, nor is it by getting a premium eyepiece. I argue that some of the biggest improvements come by switching from observing with one eye to observing with both eyes simultaneously. And here I'm not talking about ditching your telescopes and starting observing the night sky only with binoculars, but rather upgrading the viewing experience with a telescope by using a bino viewer. Luckily, I have the Max Bright 2 here with me today and I can show you exactly what I mean. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get this video on the road. Hi, I'm Bogdan Damian and welcome to BD Observatory. Bader Planetarium is a well-known German manufacturer of astronomical equipment based in Mammendorf, Bavaria. They made a name for themselves by producing observatories for schools and universities. Later, they began diversifying their portfolio by designing and producing eyepieces and telescope accessories as well. Their products are known both for their excellent quality and a vast ecosystem of accessories and adapters all compatible with each other. One of their more popular product categories is the BinoViewer. It includes two devices, the MaxBright 2 and the Wide Field Mark V Giant Bino. With the Mark V being the bigger, better and more expensive version. But this doesn't mean that the MaxBright 2 shouldn't be taken seriously, far from it. When Bader generously agreed to send one over for this review, I got really excited because it gave me the chance to test the aforementioned theory firsthand. And without giving too much away, it was quite the transformative experience from setting everything up to observing with it for the first time. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with the unboxing first. The Max Pride arrived in its own small hard case, which looks quite nice and makes a rugged impression. Inside we find the Bino Viewer itself, a Zeiss micro bayonet for the shortest possible connection to different telescope systems and a small tool for attaching and removing it. Inside the case there is also room for a 2 inch diagonal, should you want to place the Bino Viewer with it attached inside. This is a nice little detail which goes to show that they put some thought in the packaging as well. Taking the Bino out for the first time, I noticed how compact and solid it feels. Size-wise, I would compare it to a small 8x32mm pair of binoculars. The weight of almost 600 grams comes from the housing made fully out of metal and all the glass inside. The Bino Viewer comes with a T2 coupling nut at the front. This allows you to attach it directly to a compatible diagonal without the need for a nose piece on the Bino or eyepiece clamp on the diagonal. You could attach a one and a quarter inch nose piece to the Bino Viewer, but this would only add a few extra millimeters to the light path and you definitely want to avoid that. Why this is so important, I'm going to show you later in the video, so stay with me. Moving towards the back of the device, I would like to quickly mention the hinge between the two halves of the Bino, because I really like it. It's very sturdy and smooth at the same time, allowing for fine adjustments of the IPD or interpupillary distance, the range here being from 55 to 75 millimeters. At the back end of the Bino are of course two one and a quarter inch eyepiece holders, which feature very nice self-centering click lock eyepiece clamps with built-in diopter adjustments in a stacked configuration. And these are simply a joy to use, very easy and smooth and precise at the same time. These eyepiece clamps are definitely one of my favorite features of this Bino. On the inside, the MaxBright 2 features a combination of 27mm wide prisms that first help split the incoming light into two separate beams, one for each eyepiece, so that the used eyepiece or accessory can take over and deliver the images to both eyes. 
Important to note here is that all glass surfaces are fully multi-coated using a seven-layer proprietary technology for improving contrast levels and reducing unwanted internal reflections. The main goal here being to conserve as much light information as possible while the light travels inside the bino towards the eyepieces. Talking about the optical elements inside, we arrive at one of the most important characteristics of any bino viewer, the clear aperture. Since this limits the maximum width of the eyepieces field stop that can be used. Go beyond this value and vignetting starts becoming an issue. In other words, this value tells us how wide the beam of light passing through the bino is so that we can choose eyepieces with an appropriate field stop, ideally eyepieces that doesn't exceed this value. If the field stop of the eyepiece is wider than the clear aperture of the bino, then the edges of the field of view as observed through the eyepiece won't receive any light and therefore appear dark. In such a case, a bino won't be able to feed the eyepieces enough light to make use of their full field stop. The clear aperture of the max bright is 26 mm at the telescope facing side and 25.5 mm at the other end. This means that even long focal length eyepieces like the 32 mm classic plusels with a 50 degree apparent field of view and a 26 mm field stop will be almost fully illuminated without producing any visible vignetting. Since the field stop is influenced by the apparent field of view, eyepieces with longer focal length and wider apparent field of views will produce vignetting in the max sprite too. In this case, you might want to consider its bigger brother that uses larger 30 mm wide prisms. But overall, the Max Sprite 2 makes a very solid impression. Everything is tight and well thought out, making it a joy to use. But how is the actual viewing experience and how good is the optical quality? I've tested the Max Sprite 2 in combination with my 4 inch F7 ED refractor from my backyard under Bortle 4 Skies. Initially, I also wanted to test it using my 12 inch F5 DOB as well, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to get my hands on an appropriate glass path corrector in time for this video. While on the refractor, I tested the bino using a pair of SV230 super zoom eyepieces from Siboni, a pair of 17.5mm Morpheus eyepieces from Bader, and a couple of 32mm classic plusers from Bader as well. In terms of accessories, I used an ultra slim 1.25 inch focuser adapter, a 90 degree 32mm prism diagonal and a 2.6x glass path corrector, all from Bader. The glass path corrector, or in short GPC, was placed between the diagonal and the bino to get the necessary back focus for sharp views. Since we're talking about back focus, I want to get into a bit more detail here because this is actually a make or break topic if you plan on using a bino viewer with your telescope. You see, every telescope viewed by itself, so without any accessories, has a fixed focal point in space that is somewhere near the focuser on the optical axis. The focuser features a draw tube that slides in and out along this optical axis to help the eyepiece, camera or whatever accessory you might use reach that focal point precisely, only then images become sharp. Now with this in mind, imagine adding another 11 centimeters to the back of the telescope in form of a max bright bino. Somehow the focuser's draw tube now needs to compensate for the extra length by moving inwards at least 11 centimeters relative to the fixed focal point of the telescope. And therein lies the potential problem, as most focusers aren't able to compensate for the extra distance the light has to travel when a bino is added. The SV503 I'm using certainly can't, which is why I needed to add a special accessory called a glass path corrector between the diagonal and the bino. 
The job of this lens is simple. Acting like a bellow lens, the GPC moves the focal point of the telescope outwards, helping the focuser's draw tube to reach that point in space. Moving the focal point outwards also means a magnification increase for the whole system, just like when using a bellow. For my current setup, I calculated the back focus as follows. My SV503 102mm telescope has a calculated back focus of 116mm, so this is my base value. The ultra thin 1.25 inch focuser adapter then uses up 1mm of back focus. The 32mm prism diagonal uses up another 35mm. The 2.6 times GPC gives me back around 65 millimeters of back focus, and the MaxBright 2 Bino uses up about 110 millimeters of extra light path. Now, if we do the math, I end up with 35 millimeters of draw tube travel to play with and adjust for the different eyepieces. Seeing that Bader's 1.7 times GPC gives back around 35 mm of back focus, in theory I could have used that as well. I would still have 5 mm of draw tube travel to play with, but this might be a bit too short for some eyepieces, so I stuck with the 2.6 GPC for this test. So you see, knowing exactly how long the path is that the light has to travel is very important here. So keep this in mind when planning for a bino viewer. All right, now back to the test. Pointing the telescope up and looking at Saturn with the bino was truly a different experience compared to observing with only one eye. The whole viewing experience is so much more comfortable with my eyes completely relaxed. This allowed me to notice finer details more easily. Also, the perceived size of the planet through the bino was a bit greater than when observing with only one eye. The perceived brightness and contrast were also higher when using both my eyes. I know that optically this can't be the case, but subjectively it is what I was able to notice. I suspect that these effects must have something to do with the way our brains are wired for stereoscopic vision. No doubt that the great optics inside the Max Bright were playing a crucial role as well in delivering sharp and contrast-rich images. At no point I had the impression that the bino was bottlenecking the optical system, even when using the excellent Morpheus eyepieces. Regardless if I was observing Saturn, the Moon or the Pleiades, the views remained constant in terms of quality. The bino never skipped a beat. But for me the biggest change was when roaming around the night sky, especially along the Milky Way. Here a pair of simple 32mm prisers with a relatively narrow apparent field of view of only 50 degrees were able to deliver one of the most immersive experiences I had so far with a telescope. I can only imagine what a Mark V giant bino with a couple of wide field eyepieces can achieve. Simply amazing. No wonder that out of the three eyepieces I tested the Max Sprite with, my favorite pairing was with the two 32mm classic prisers. When observing Saturn or planets in general, a pair of Morpheus eyepieces is very hard to beat though. The two SV230 zoom eyepieces from Siboni also performed very well, offering great focal length flexibility and very good image quality. They just couldn't match the brightness of the Morpheus eyepieces. Just to show you a rough idea of what to expect in terms of image quality, here are some daytime shots taken with my phone through one of the eyepieces of a distant target. Taking photos with my phone at night through the eyepieces leads to very inconsistent results and far from what the eye can actually see in reality, so I stick to daytime photos only. As you can see, the images are sharp right up to the edge, no matter what eyepiece I used. Any optical distortion around the edges 
comes from me not being able to place the camera of the phone perfectly square on top of the eyepiece's lens. Brightness and contrast is also very good, even though what you are seeing right now is the image in only one of the two eyepieces. There are some slight color aberrations or color fringing visible in high contrast regions like on this flagpole for example, but this comes from the telescope's objective not being able to fully correct the incoming light and not from the bino or the eyepiece. With the addition of such an optically complex element to an existing system, there is always the risk of losing too much light information resulting in a noticeably lower image quality. But as it turns out, this isn't a case with the MaxBright 2. The incoming light gathered by the telescope, while significantly altered on the path to your eyes, manages to retain almost all of the information as it exits the bino which is why the resulting image, now being able to be viewed by both eyes, doesn't present any visible degradation. On the contrary, thanks to the stereoscopic vision, there even seems to be an improvement visible, albeit a subjective one. This combined with the vast number of accessories and adapters already existent in Bader's ecosystem makes the MaxBrite 2 one of the easiest to recommend bino viewers on the market right now. So I really mean what I stated in the beginning of this video, that upgrading from mono to stereoscopic vision yields greater improvements with respect to viewing experience than simply upgrading the telescope or eyepiece. And for me at least, this is a game-changing experience. Anyway, that's been it. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to subscribe. Also, let me know what you think about the Max Bright 2 and about Bino viewers in general. I'm very much looking forward to reading your opinions in the comments below. Thanks for watching and catch you guys in the next one.